new commission, a new European Parliament and a new US administration. What does this all mean for the future of Europe? I chat to Jakob Kiertgarden on the Europe Conversation. So, Jakob, we're coming into a new commission, uh, a new European Parliament, um, and I want to start off with the Middle East because obviously this week we had the anniversary of the 7th of October Hamas attack. With that, we've seen horrendous conditions in Gaza as a result of the Israeli response and also a, a widened regional spread of war. What implications does this have for Europe? Well, I think the, the short answer is that in, in economic terms, Unfortunately, the implications for Europe really resides on the risk of escalation, aka that Israel may or may not choose to strike the Iranian oil sector, Iran may then retaliate, and oil may rise significantly in price. Uh, that, that's really the economic risk. Uh, politically, uh, for the EU, I think we're, we have seen over the last number of many months, in fact, that obviously this is a conflict that retains this ability to, to mobilize significant segments of European populations. It varies from country to country. But what, it, what you lack, basically, for the EU is, of course, unity. Um, one of the sort of charges leveled against the EU in relation to this is double standards that there isn't the same support or empathy for the Palestinians as there is for Ukrainians. Um, and that has impacted the EU's, I suppose, reputation within the global south, something that Brussels has been trying to garner support for when it comes to the war in Ukraine. How do you see this playing out? No, I think it is true. I mean, I think it's important for Europeans to recognize that while we clearly view the conflict in Ukraine as the first existential armed conflict really threatening the military security of Europe, arguably in a number, since World War II uh, in some ways, or certainly since the end of the Cold War. Uh, and therefore, we view that rightfully, in my opinion, as an existential crisis. But in the eyes of the global south, uh, who do not, you know, fear imminent invasion by Russia, uh, well, it's just, quote-unquote, another regional conflict. So that we in Europe, but also in the broader G7, are sort of trying to actively uh, solicit their support for Ukraine for what, in their eyes, is a regional conflict, while we, again, in their eyes, are ignoring not just the Israel-Palestine conflict, but many other regional conflicts, armed conflicts, uh, across uh, the global south, yes, uh, in their eyes, that's clearly uh, hypocrisy. And I think, again, if you look from where they come, they have a point. So we see it as an existential crisis, yet at the same time, we hear from the Ukrainians, from President Zelensky, we don't have enough weapons. Um, we, you know, our soldiers are on the front line and they're suffering for the want of weapons. Well, I think there's no doubt that U Ukraine is, continues to fight a very determined and very much larger uh, neighbor in Russia. So they are inherently the underdog, if you can put it that way. They have received uh, very significant amounts of financial and military support from the West. But the war is entering now, uh, is well into its third year, and there are concerns, not just with the upcoming U.S. presidential election, but also domestic politics in many European countries. Is this sustainable? I think the good news, in my opinion, is that I believe in Europe, with the clear exception of Hungary, uh, possibly Slovakia, but let's put it this way, all the countries in Europe with real money and military capabilities are strongly behind Ukraine. I suspect that situation will uh, persist precisely because uh, we do have to view this conflict uh, as an existential one because I think it is naive to assume that if Russia were to prevail, in Ukraine that they would quote unquote just stop at those four provinces that they have already annexed. But at the same time we've heard from President Zelensky he has his um, vision for ending the war, his victory plan which he presented at the United Nations General Assembly at Rammstein in Germany to NATO allies and the response has been tepid. There's no um, complete embrace of this response from the United States, which hasn't said it, it can give support for, for example, the use of long-range weapons into Russian territory. We've heard Chancellor Scholz saying Germany would never agree to that. And what we do know of the plan is that it's very offensive. So it doesn't appear that the Allies are, you know, four square behind Zelensky on this. I think you need to have uh, Russia put under military pressure. And I think that is really what this plan strives to do. 
uh, that will require, clearly in the eyes of, uh, uh, you know, President Zelensky and the Ukrainian government, the ability to strike uh, strategic targets with Western weapons deep in Russian territory. Clearly, as you mentioned, the U.S. government, the German government do not see it that way. But there are other European governments, including those who have delivered F-16s and other missiles, uh, long-range missile to them, that actually are in favor of it. So we will see... Uh, where we end up, and I think it should also be mentioned, and I think this is, again, one of these uh, areas which at least gives me uh, a, a relatively high degree of, of optimism, actually, about Ukraine's ability to ultimately prevail, which is the growth of Ukraine's domestic military industrial complex and capabilities, where we have seen in recent weeks and months the rising use of accurate long-range drone strikes by Ukraine on you know Russian uh, ammunition depots, energy uh, storage facilities, etc. At the 75th anniversary of NATO in Washington DC, Ukraine was told there was an indestructible bridge towards membership, not quite membership, but no timeline. Do you think Ukraine will become a member of NATO or do you s foresee that it may have to give up NATO membership, at least in the short to medium term, in order to negotiate uh, Russia leaving its territory? I think they will become a member of NATO, uh, but I think it is arguably more important uh, for Ukraine that they become a member of the EU. Uh, because I think that ultimately Ukraine will prevail in this war, meaning that they are able to uh, deter Russian aggression, even without being a member of uh, uh, NATO, provided that they have access to ongoing Western financial and military support, which in principle, I think they could have without being a member uh, of NATO. What matters for Ukraine, uh, however, in the long run, is money financing to rebuild the economy and full integration with uh, the EU so that they can completely turn their back, which is clearly what they want, uh, to any links in the energy sector and otherwise with Russia. That requires, in my opinion, uh, full EU membership uh, uh, in the relatively near to medium term, meaning... Like 2030? Yeah, early 2030s. And, and this, ironically also, in my opinion, would prove a much bigger uh, long-term threat to Vladimir Putin and indeed the entire Russian regime. Because what this would provide Ukraine was an opportunity to become, I would argue, a fast-growing uh, market economy-based democracy, fully anchored in the EU, clearly showing uh, the Russian population that, you know what, there is an alternative uh, to the autocracy perpetrated on them by Vladimir Putin and his likely successors. And do you not think countries like Hungary will go out of their way to block Ukraine's accession every step of the way, which we've seen so far? <sighs> Viktor Orban will try to curry favor with his true political masters, which are, in my opinion, in Moscow and increasingly also in Beijing. He may try that, but ultimately, we are now seeing the growth of, uh, you know, domestic opposition parties in uh, Hungary. If we manage by the rest of the EU to continue the financial squeeze uh, on Hungary through uh, the budget, I think, uh, you know, in the, at the end of the day, and again, we're talking maybe 10 years, uh, for the final decision for Ukrainian membership to be taken. It is not clear that the Hungarian regime, if I may use that word, uh, is act, does have that level of longevity given the domestic developments and econ ongoing, I hope, economic pressure that he will face within the EU. And you say political paymasters, do you mean because of the investment Beijing and Moscow have in Hungary? No, I don't. I mean, I think it is clear that Hungary, having clearly written off, I would argue, uh, many of the future, currently frozen and future uh, transfers from the EU. What have they done instead? Clearly, with regard, they continue to elicit uh, Russian energy imports, including uh, building a new nuclear power plant. Uh, with the case of China, he has signed, uh, among other things, clearly, in my opinion, to continue to offer a, if you like, uniquely politically uh, preferred destination for Chinese investment in the EU, a security 
treaty with China that allows Chinese police officers to patrol with Hungarian police officers on the streets of uh, Hungary. That is something that no other EU member can offer and may, in fact, uh, choose to uh, maybe the deciding political factor when the Chinese quote unquote private companies or state owned companies choose where to locate their investments. Just final question for Litigo because we have about three weeks to go to the US election. Um, what are your predictions? And, you know, regardless of who wins, do you think that Europe is on its way to de risk? from its relationship with the United States, or is that just impossible, at least for the short term? Yeah, I think it is in the short term, in a military sense, it is clearly impossible. I mean, NATO without a fully committed United States is just not NATO. At the same time, I think the fact, irrespective of who wins, the fact that a candidate like Donald Trump might be re-elected, I mean, he could actually win and be re-elected, in my opinion, clearly cast doubt about the long-term viability of, uh, or the value, if you like, of NATO's Article 5. So irrespective of who wins, Europe doesn't have any choice other than to do what some of the things that was in the Draghi report as well, to achieve a much higher degree of self-sufficiency in military national security uh, issues. The EU can only achieve that if we manage to fully integrate Ukraine uh, into the European economies, because we're already seeing the growth of domestic Ukrainian weapons production. They have an existing, uh, you know, military industrial complex. They will become, I think, the arsenal of the EU. Okay, Jakob Kirkgaard, Senior Fellow at Bruegel, thank you very much for joining us on the Europe Conversation. My pleasure.